Well, thank you, young people. Thank you, Steve. Great morning. We uh, are thrilled about what God does in the hearts of young people and how God uses all of his children and certainly wants to use all of his children, no matter what our ages are, no matter where we are in life, God seeks to use us. This morning, the title of the message is uh, dealing with the fact that there, with God, are no insignificant ones, uh, that everyone is significant. Our young people are significant. You're significant. Uh, in God's mind, there is none who is uh, without uh, consideration, and so I'm thankful to the Lord for this. This morning, we're not going to be back in Second Thessalonians, but we will be taking a quick look here at the life of Moses and how God used Moses in a tremendous way. And part of the message this morning and the impetus behind it is to encourage our young people to avail themselves of God, to be used by God in a very great way, and also to challenge us, uh, those of us who are a bit older now, to also yield our lives as servants of the Most High as well. If you need a Bible this morning, these young ladies would love to put one in your hand, so slip up your hand when they come down through the aisle way, and they'll make sure that you receive a Bible. Francis Schaeffer wrote uh, this book, No Little People. It's a compilation of messages and uh, speaking uh, engagements that he had over the years. If you're not familiar with his writings, I recommend them. Uh, in his book, he, in the first chapter, talks about the significance of Moses and how Moses had the staff of God in his hand. So if you turn your, your Bible to Exodus chapter 3 this morning, I want to begin by looking here at chapter three and the events surrounding God laying his hand on Moses in a very unique way. The Bible says now Moses was pastoring the flock uh, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side. And, and so the angel of the Lord, verse two, appeared to him as he's doing this, this uh, shepherding. And the Bible says that he appears to him in a very miraculous way. Now up until this time period, there hasn't been a lot of miracles. This has been something unusual to say the least. So Moses takes note of the fact that there's a blazing fire that's taking place in the middle of a bush. And the Bible says he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not being consumed. And so Moses took note of that. You'd take note of that, wouldn't you, if you saw that happening? And remember, there's not a lot of miracles every day type of thing. And Moses, the Bible says, turned aside, and he said, I have to turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. Why the bush is not being burned up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, wow. And he said, here I am, Lord. And then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Any place that we encounter the Holy One is holy ground. And this is exactly what's happening here in the life of Moses. He has come into the presence of God, or should I say the presence of God has come to him. He says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God, and wisely so. God has appeared to Moses for something that's very, very special and very unique. This is out of the ordinary to be sure. And what he says to Moses is kind of a rallying cry for Moses. It is music to Moses' ears. For the Lord would say in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of the taskmasters, and he says, I'm aware of their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Isn't that good news to Moses' ears? 
I mean, to this point, Moses would be absolutely over the top excited that God has come down to give him this great message that the people of Israel who are being oppressed are no longer going to be oppressed, but they are going to be delivered from that. And they are not only going to be delivered from that, but God says, I'm going to take you to your own land, a spacious land, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Can I get a hooray? This is good. What if I was to say to you, wouldn't it be great to memorize 900 verses? It only takes the young people 12 years to do it. I mean, a lot of you plan to live 12 more years, don't you? You, you say, well, yeah, it would be great to do it, but what if I said, how about you doing it? Wouldn't it be great for somebody else to do it? Wouldn't it be great for the kids to do it, right? The kids should come on Tuesday night. They should learn the 900 verses, but what if God said, I want you to learn 900 verses? I believe I would hear the similar story as Moses, because when God comes to Moses in verse 19, he says, therefore, come now. In other words, Moses has given him the reasoning behind this this vision that has transpired, this theophany that has taken place in Moses' midst. And he says, and here's where the rubber meets the road. He says, and I will send you to Pharaoh. I've got plans for you, Moses. Not someone else, not somebody that looks like you, not somebody from a background that's similar to yours. He says, Moses, I've got plans for you. That you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Up until this point, Moses was 100% behind the words of God. And all of a sudden now, things are going to become challenging. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, direct our thoughts as we come into this passage of Scripture to understand exactly what you were able to do with Moses. A man not unlike ourselves in many, many ways. A man who had weaknesses, a man who was yet perfect, a man who was just willing to avail himself of the working of God. Father, may our hearts today to be challenged by this passage of Scripture, and may we ultimately yield ourselves, Father, to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 27, it says that God cho- has chosen the weak, the sick, the feeble things, to shame or to humiliate the people who consider themselves to be strong. God has gone out of his way to take those of us who are not perfect and use us in his plan. In John chapter 9, we read about the instance of the disciples coming upon a man who was blind from birth. And the question is asked of Jesus, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither sinned. This man is born blind so that he might be able to show and display the mighty power of God in his life. We know that Jesus healed that man and that man went forth telling the world about the works of Jesus and his ability to heal him. You see, God is, over time, used people who are very unlikely, people who had all types of issues. And so when we stop and we think about Moses, here is Moses' objection. And maybe you and I can relate to this, but Moses said to God, after God's challenged him and said, you are my man, he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? And the answer there, if God was to be honest with him, we'd be, you're nothing. But the great thing is, you don't have to be something in order to be used by God. You see, we all start out as nothing. God's not interested in using your great abilities. God's not interested in trying to to take you and, and make you great. What God is interested in is simple people who will simply come to him and say, here am I, Lord. You can use me. In Exodus chapter 4, we come to the passage of Scripture. I love this passage. He says here, then Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? So the objections are coming. And he says, for they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. In other words, you're crazy, Moses. (laughs) You're telling us that there was a bush and the bush was on fire, but the bush didn't burn up. And then all of a sudden you heard Moses, Moses. And you said, yeah, and God was talking to me. And they said, man, what did you have to eat last night? 
The Lord said to him, if they say, we don't believe you, Moses, Moses, you're out of your mind, God says to him, what is in your hand, Moses? And Moses was just standing there, you know, like he always stood there. Remember in chapter 3, what did we find Moses doing when he was introduced to us? Pastoring the flock of Jethro. He was a shepherd. And shepherds had staffs. Not like staff as in secretary and assistant and all that, you know. But he had a staff. He had a, one of those wooden sticks. That wooden stick it was probably old. Moses had probably been carrying that thing around for years. And he's having a discussion with God, and as he's standing there, he's got this staff in his hand, this rod in his hand, and how interesting it was. He says, what do you have in your hand? And Moses looked over to see what was in his hand and said, I got a rod in my hand. I got a staff. And God says, I want you to do something with that staff right now, Moses. I want you to throw it on the ground, Moses. And Moses listened to God and said, oh, okay, and he threw it on the ground. And you know what happened to that? The Bible says that it turned into a serpent. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. Most logical thing Moses does is the next words, he fled from it. <laughs> I'm telling you what, if I threw down a stick and it became a snake, I'd be out of there. I do not like that at all. I was over in Africa when I was teaching. We took a little side trip after the teaching was done. We went out to this uh, safari place, and they had this big snake exhibit. And if you know anything about me, you know that I absolutely detest any type of serpent like that. I mean to tell you, I have killed my fair share. My best, I love to see him going through the grass when I'm on the riding mower. I don't even have to think about it or pray about it. I don't have to fast. I, there's not time for that. <laughs> I got to tell you, we had snakes around our house back in Massachusetts. Lived in a nice development, but there were snakes, vipers as it were. Probably garden variety. So I got snake repellent. I sprayed snake repellent all around the bushes. Do you know what snake repellent smells like? It is the most foul-smelling stuff you've ever smelled in your life. And one little mist of that will absolutely drive you out of your home. I sprayed it on a Sunday afternoon. We had prayer meeting on Sunday night. No one would pray with me. They asked me to leave the room, and that is true. You can ask my wife. Boy, did I reek. So I came out of the house one day that, that same week, and uh, I didn't expect to see any more of those little vipers. And I came out, and lo and behold, right in the bush that's right next to the front steps is a coiled up rascal looking right at me. Here I'd sprayed the stuff on the ground. They didn't like it, so they climbed to the top of the bushes. <laughs> I got him with a baseball bat. It was a great swing. It was a home run drive, and he was never the same. In fact, he didn't last long after that. Moses realizes, you know what? This is terrible. It's turned into a snake. And what does God say to him? These are some of the most fearful words in all of Scripture. He says, go over there and pick it up by the tail. Ay, ay, ay. Lord, ask me anything, but don't ask me to pick up that viper by the tail. But he did it. He went over, and the Bible says he picked it up. He stretched forth his hand. He caught it, and it became a staff in his hand again. And this is what God says, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you. They have questions about the validity of your claim that you have talked to me and I am going to be used by God to deliver you. God says, listen, you've got that staff in your hand, just show them what you can show them. Put it down. It'll only take once probably because they're not going to be interested in seeing which way that viper is going to go. Wouldn't you love to know what kind of viper it was? Probably one of those black mambas or something terrible. Whoo! There's Moses, minding his own business, out in a field with a bunch of sheep, having one of those non-eventful days. You know, one of those laid-back, easy-going days. And all of a sudden, there's a bush on fire. All of a sudden, God's speaking to him. All of a sudden, God's got great plans for him. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty astounding when you stop and you think about it. You see, Moses had some serious questions. And he comes back after God has explained this and has revealed to him how he can make his point known to the people. And Moses says here, in verse 15 there, he's saying, or verse 10, he says, Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, 
I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past. I love that. I've never been, I, I can't speak well now, and I never could, really. He says, I'm slow of speech. I, I'm slow of tongue. And the Lord says, who's made you? I, I've made you. I know you. And yet you're exactly the person that I want to do this job. Do you think for a moment that God got it wrong? That somehow God selected this man for this job and forgot somehow that he was slow of speech? People, some people think he maybe had a stuttering problem. I'm not sure what it was. But the Lord wasn't too happy with it. That is his complaining. Ultimately, it led them to Aaron, who was eloquent and was able then to be the mouthpiece of Moses. And so Moses would speak what God wanted him to say, and there was agreement with that. But through this process, God had planned to reveal his power to the people of Israel and to the people of Egypt. And he would use this mighty staff that was in the hand of Moses. The Bible tells us in verse 20 there, so Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. I don't want you to miss that because it's a very important point. When God first says to Moses, what is in your hand? Moses looked over and he said, oh, that's my staff. Whose staff was it in the beginning of this chapter? Moses' staff. Whose staff is it now? God's staff. You see, what God was saying is, this is now my staff. I've put my power in your hand. And if you will follow me, you will see many amazing things accomplished. Just look at all the things that God accomplishes with the staff. It was a staff of judgment. You may think back to, to Exodus chapter 7, and we don't have time to look at these this morning, but Pharaoh's staff, um, when I think of his sorcerers and his magicians and all of that, Pharaoh says to, to, to Moses, you know, let's see a sign, and Moses shows him the snake. He puts it right down there, and it becomes a snake, and whoa, Pharaoh looks back and says, let me get my guys together, and he brings together the sorcerers and the magicians, and they throw their staffs down, and what happens? Their staffs also become snakes. But the staff of God that had become that viper ate up all of the other staffs. And my friends, that shows the power of Almighty God. Amen? Oh, our Satan is, uh, our adversary Satan is very powerful, but our God, there is none like him. He is more powerful than the adversary ever will be. It was also a, a rod of supply. Think of the time in Exodus chapter 17 when the people of Israel are complaining that they don't have any water and God allows for the staff of Moses to be used to strike the rock and water comes pouring out of it enough for all the people of Israel. Now, that's not a small miracle in and of itself. That is a huge miracle right there. It was also a rod of deliverance. In Exodus chapter 14, the staff is used to part the water of the Red Sea as they're leaving Egypt, and as the armies of Egypt, the most fearful armies in the world at the time, are bearing down on them, it is God's staff that opens that water up. Is that exciting? It was also the rod of victory. Exodus chapter 17, the Amalekites, there's a big war, and every time Moses took the staff of God and raised it up over his head, the people of Israel were victorious. And when he got tired, he put it down and they'd begin to lose. And so two men came alongside of him. The Bible gives us their names and they hold it up. Old Aaron's there, he's holding it up. And they're holding it up over Moses' head and the people of Israel were triumphant. It was a rod of victory. It was also a rod of determination when the people of Israel were murmuring against Moses. They took all the leaders, the 12 tribes, and they brought their staffs together, put them together overnight, and when they came back, there was one dead stick that had somehow come to life. My friends, that's a huge miracle. 
It was so huge that ultimately Aaron's staff, which I personally believe is the same as Moses' staff here, I believe this is the one staff, is put there in the Ark of the Covenant. Hebrews will tell us that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that our surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. God wants to use us. It's one of the most amazing things in all of Scripture is the fact that God wants to use earthen vessels, jars of clay, like you and me. God seeks to do that. It's all about God all the time, isn't it? It's all about God. God is showing to Moses, Moses, this really isn't about you, it's about me. I'm doing a work here and you're privileged to be part of that work. Sometimes I don't know why it's so hard to get people to serve the Lord. I think it's, it's the most fantastic thing in the world. I remember when I was a youngster, I was taught a very powerful lesson. As many of you know, I've shared my testimony. I was saved at the age of seven years old. Came home after a Sunday night service where the preacher was preaching. And I was very convicted and I went to my mother and asked her if she would pray with me. And I prayed and put my faith in Jesus Christ. That was 51 years ago. The very next year I was baptized. We had long classes that you had to go through and I was baptized by immersion at the age of eight. And I remember there was a big deal we had at church during the summer that year, 1965. And an evangelist rolled into town, but he didn't only bring his RV with him, he also brought horse trailers. He had horses. And we were going to have this big evangelistic rodeo for kids. And if you know anything back in the 60s, I'll tell you, our, our heroes were people like, like Roy Rogers and, and uh, you know, the, the, the Lone Ranger. And th this, was, this was the deal. I mean, I waited all week long for, for Roy Rogers to come on. I mean, I had everything. I even met him. I even sat on his horse before it died. Um, I think they stuffed it and people sat on it afterwards. I, I, I always make the point, oh, it was a lie. That would creep me out. To, yeah, anyway. We had this huge rodeo at church. We filled this little auditorium. It was truly an amazing time. And the evangelist got up and he began to preach. And I'll tell you, he preached and he preached. And the power of God was in that place that day. And when he gave an invitation, dozens and dozens of young people came forward to put their faith in Jesus Christ. One of the most exciting days of my life. And they grabbed adults here and they grabbed adults there and the adults would have sometimes six or seven kids with them. I remember my mother going off to, to pray. She had about seven girls with her that, she was, that, that had come forward, wanted to know more about Jesus Christ or place their faith in Jesus Christ and they ran out of personal workers. And the evangelist looked over at me. I've been saved a year. And he said, Kevin, will you go pray with these three boys? They were older than me. I was scared to death. But I just learned Romans Road. If you're familiar with the Romans Road, it's how a process that you might be able to just go from one verse of scripture to the next and explain the whole gospel of salvation. So inside my Bible, in the first page of my Bible, just inside the cover, I'd written Romans 3.10. There's none righteous, no, not one. And next, to, so then I went to Romans 3.10. And I went to Romans 3.10 and written next to that was Romans 3.23, so I went there. And then it was written Romans 6.23, I went there. And then over Romans 5.8 and then over Romans chapter 10. And I laid it all out for these young boys and I said, would you like to pray and ask Jesus to save you? And they said yes. And every one of them prayed out loud. My friends, that's the power of God doing that. Because at eight years old, just like I am today, I'm nothing. I am only a tool in God's hand. That's it. That's it. And it's very humbling when you watch and you see the power of God at work. I had no theological training. <laughs> I had a few years of Sunday school. I guess that's about all. But I watched God work. And I was reminded that it is God who wants to do a work. And that we are just earthen vessels, but we are privileged to have his treasure reside in this earthen vessel to accomplish his purposes. You see, Moses, you're really nothing. But with God, you're everything. 
with the power of God in your hand, God wants to do amazing things. Unfortunate thing in Moses' life, and it's an example that shouldn't go past us. In Numbers chapter 20, if you take your Bible, you look over there at Numbers chapter 20 with me, it's a, probably a familiar event that takes place in Moses' life. And up until this point in time, Moses has been using the staff of God in a, a fantastic way. But in, Acts, in Numbers chapter 20, we have the people of Israel murmuring against Moses. And the Bible says uh, there was no water for the congregation, chapter 20, verse 2. We're in Numbers. We've gone backwards a couple books or to the, towards the back. And the Bible says the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. What in the world are you folks talking about? They are coming to Moses and they are complaining. They're complaining ultimately to God and they're basically saying, oh, we wish we'd have died already. Who talks like that? This is Jehovah God that you're worshiping. He has already worked miracle upon miracle. Who, who does that? And so God comes to Moses and he says, take the rod. You and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield water and you shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink and so Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he had commanded him and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and he said to them listen now you rebels shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock and Moses lifted up his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod and water came forth. Now, unless you didn't catch that and you're taking a nap, uh, you heard me read that God said you're supposed to speak to the rock, not smite it. I would be willing to guess that Moses took his staff, and the Bible doesn't tell us everything that was said in between. Somebody mouthed off. Somebody said something. Moses took the staff. I'll bet you he took it with two hands. I'll bet you he wound up. I'll bet you he whacked that thing, and he thought to himself, I don't even care what happens to this stick anymore. He was so angry, and not only did he hit it once, he wound up a second time. If you all didn't see it, here it is. Wham, and he wailed it again. Before you're too hard on Moses, Moses is described, does anybody know the attribute that Moses is described as? The meekest man on the earth. From our study in the Beatitudes, we know that meekness means to have authority and power under control. He's the meekest man on the earth. In other words, if you or I was standing there with the staff of God, we'd have wrapped it around somebody's head long before that. We'd have been smacking all kinds of things. We'd have been sicking the snake on people. I mean, we would have been dangerous. And there's Moses, and he loses it. Let's not be too hard on him. He can't go and see the promised land, but I'll tell you, when the Mount of Tr Transfiguration was taking place, who did God summon? He brought up Moses, didn't he? Moses is going to have a very honored position in the millennial kingdom. Moses is a tremendous example of many, many positive things. But he's also an example to us that we can take that staff back. We can forget whose staff it is. We can take the me and us and take it back from God. We can consecrate it to the Lord, but there are times when we want to pull it back. There's a verse up there, 2 Timothy 2. And he says, now in a large house, there's not only gold and silver vessels, but vessels of wood and earthenware. Some are to honor and some are to dishonor. Let me challenge you, what kind of vessel are you in the hands of the Lord? You see, it's not the most important thing who you are because there are no significant and insignificant people. Only people who are consecrated to God or those who are not. One of two. Will you come before the Lord in quietness? One of the things I really liked about that first chapter of, of Schaefer's book is he calls us to become quiet before the Lord. 
look to the Lord in a humble, quiet way and ask ourselves, God, what is he trying to do with me? Think about what God wants to do with your life. There's no insignificant people. There's no insignificant places. God can use us when we're this big and when we're this big. He can use us when we're young. He can use us when we're a teenager. He can use us when we're middle-aged or elderly. It doesn't matter with God. There is no one that's insignificant. The key is what God has called us to be is consecrated before him, set aside as holy unto the Lord. Is that your desire today? Would you be honest enough to say, my life is not about me, but my life is about Jesus Christ? Sometimes people, I think, live their lives in fear, overly concerned about themselves. And it seems like there's only a few people who would go out on a limb for Christ. I saw this picture and it reminded me of what it's like to go out on a limb for Christ. What would you do to follow the Lord? Would you follow him wherever he may lead you? I trust this morning that you would be willing, if God would tap you on the shoulder, to follow him, that you would understand that your life in his hands, he being the potter and you being the clay, is able to accomplish great things for him because ultimately we are a tool in his hand. Let's pray. This morning as I close with a word of prayer, let me just urge you today, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone, make the decision to do that today. There are many people in the world today who have no idea where their eternity is going to be spent. There is all types of falsehoods and lies being propagated among people in the world today. Satan has become craftier and craftier. But this morning... I would urge you to stop and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and place your faith and trust in him. Perhaps you're here this morning and God spoke into your heart as a believer. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Kevin, God's tugging at my heart to be the tool that he wants me to be for his honor and glory. Maybe you've been the one in control. Would you yield your life to him today? Would you say, Lord, here I am. I consecrate myself to you. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's doing a work in my life. God's tugging at my heart today. Is there anyone at all who would say, Pastor, pray for me as you close in prayer? Just slip up your hand if he's tugging at your heart. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me, please? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the challenge that we see in the life of Moses. Lord, how I pray that if there's anyone here today who's yet to take the step of faith and place their faith in Jesus Christ, the only one who can save us from our sin, that, Father, today that choice would be made. And, Father, how I pray as well for these who've asked for prayer, Lord, you're doing a work in their life. Lord, I don't know what that amounts to. I don't know what it looks like, but you do. Father, you have a plan for all of your children. You want us all to be consecrated to you, fully yielded, Lord, to your leading. Help us, Lord, not to plan out our lives according to our own desires. But Father, help us to seek your face daily, that we might know the steps you've laid in front of us, that we might follow them and bring you great joy. Father, we thank you for the example of Moses. 
even the negative aspects of his life provoke us to deep thought. And help us, Father, to push aside the objections. And help us, Father, to see that it's not about us, but it's about you. Use us, Lord, I pray, to further your kingdom and bring you great glory. Bless us, Lord, this day. We thank you so much for bringing us together. May you be glorified in the week ahead that we live. May we bring you great joy, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.